Hello and welcome. So in this video, I'm going to be demonstrating how to install the Minimalist GNU for Windows toolchain, commonly referred to as MinGW. Once installed, MinGW will allow us to get started with C++ development using the GNU compiler collection, more commonly referred to as GCC, on a Windows-based operating system. Now, GCC was not originally designed to work on Windows, which is why we need MinGW as part of the installation. Uh, GCC has arguably the most widely used C++ compiler in the world, which is why many people choose to use it for their C++ development, and indeed that is the main reason why I'm focusing on it as the focus of this video. Before I get started with the installation, I just wanted to mention that there are actually a number of different ways that you can set up a Windows machine for C++ development. The method that I'm going to be demonstrating in this video is really meant for folks who are interested in building C++ applications that will run natively on Windows using GCC. Um, near the end of the video, I'll go ahead and mention some of the other ways that you could set up a Windows-based machine for C++ development, just so you can distinguish those methods from what I'm going to demonstrate here. And I'll also talk a little bit about uh, why you might want to use one of those other methods as opposed to what I'm demonstrating, some of the pros and cons. All right, with all that said, let's go ahead and just jump in. The first thing that we're going to do to get started with this is we need to go ahead and get our hands on the binaries to install. So there's a lot of places you can go to get MinGW um, off of the internet, but the best place that I have found is a nice website called winlibs.com. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, navigate there now. So let's open up our browser and I'm going to head over here to winlibs. Dot com. And then it's going to open up this page and I realize that the page is old looking, but it is a very good and well maintained site. And basically there's a, a whole big explanation for kind of what MinGW is and kind of the rationale for this site. I'm not going to, going to walk through all of that. I am going to just kind of cruise down here to a couple of spots that might be worth mentioning just because they will dictate kind of which of the many binaries that are being offered uh, you might want to go ahead and install. Um, and so the, the first big distinction here would be the, the different runtime libraries that uh, you can use depending upon the version of Windows that you're on. So this one right here, this MSVCRT, this is the runtime that was around for a very long time in uh, the Windows operating system. Up until Windows 10, this was like the only choice. So if you are running on a Windows 8 or before operating system, then you're going to want to use the binaries that are being provided on the site that support that runtime. If you're using any other kind of operating system, so basically a more modern Windows operating system like Windows 10 or Windows 11, then you're going to want to switch over to the UCRT runtime, which is the more modern one. It's more performant really at this point. And actually those are the ones that are being first offered in his little release section down here. Now I'm running on Windows 11 on this computer, so that's why I'm picking the UCRT runtime area. But again, if you are watching this video and you're running an older version of Windows, then that would be why you would want to scroll down a little bit further and come on down here to this section. Okay. So that helps you kind of narrow down why I'm going to be picking this check, uh, section over the other. The next thing we're going to decide is which version of GCC we would like. So there might be some reason why you're doing your development that you need an older version of the GCC collection. I I can't really think of off the top of my head why you would need that, but there might be some scenario. For me, I just really want the latest and greatest, so I'm just going to pick this one that's at the very top here. That's GCC 13.2. Um, as of the date of this recording, that is the latest version that's being offered on the site. Really, the choice has now become either this one or this one, right? Uh, the differences between those two really boil down to how you would like your installation to handle threading. So without getting into too much detail, there is a difference in how threads are done for C++ development, depending upon which standard you'd like to target. Microsoft has their own threading system that they call MCF, right? And that's the sort of native threading system of Microsoft. The other one is POSIX, and this is a, a different sort of like a uh, standard, if you will. Uh, and this is more commonly used in pretty much any Unix based operating system that they use what are commonly referred to as POSIX threads. Uh, and so basically what this is asking you is if you would like to be using the you know, POSIX API for doing your multi-threaded applications, then you would want to download this one. If you are interested in just using threads that are going to run using Windows specific APIs, 
then you would want to use this one. The, the reasons why people might pick one over the other really have to do with whether or not they're intending to port their code to a different uh, operating system at some point. So if you're writing a C++ program that you know at some point is going to have to be uh, recompiled on a Linux distribution of some sort, then that would be a really good reason to pick one of these. If you know that you're pretty much always going to live in Windows and your application is just always going to use those kinds of tooling, then this would be the one. If you know you're never going to write a multi-threaded application, then honestly it doesn't matter because that's really the only difference between these two. For the purposes of this video, I'm just going to say that I'm only going to write C++ programs that run exclusively on Windows, so I'm just going to opt for the MCF uh, threaded version, and that also means that I don't have to have all this extra stuff for LLVM and, and whatnot added in there. So I kind of like to have as, as little as possible. So that pretty much nails me down into this, this one right here and then the last sort of choice that I'm making really is whether or not I would like to be running on a 32-bit operating system or a 64-bit operating system like I said before I'm running on Windows 11 and as far as I know Windows 11 and going forward uh, Microsoft has made it known that they no longer will even support a 32-bit operating system so that kind of makes the choice for me I will definitely be using the Win64 version uh, so that really just nails it down to this is the one that I want. So I'm trying to just walk through sort of my process of how I nailed it down to the version that I was going to get. And that way, if you need to make a different choice, you can kind of know why you're making the choice you're making. The last choice you really are making, even on this little uh, row here, is the whether or not to download the 7-zip archive or the zip archive. And 7-zip is just another application that you could theoretically have already installed on your computer. It's basically an archiving tool, it's a it's a compression tool that is uh, a nice one that's been around for a long time. I don't have 7-Zip installed on this computer and I don't really have any need to do that. So I'm just gonna go ahead and pick the zip archive. Uh, the advantage here is that if you already have 7-Zip, I'm pretty sure that it does a slightly better job of compressing the files and so this will be a slightly smaller uh, download and it will maybe unzip a little faster. Um, I don't really care that much, so I'm just gonna pick that. But if you have 7-Zip, that'd be a good choice. So I'm gonna go ahead and just pick this option and click click it. Okay, great. Now that it's downloaded, we can go ahead and just open the folder that it was downloaded into by clicking this little icon here. That's gonna open up my downloads folder, and as you can see, here is the uh, zipped up version of all of the binaries that we're gonna need to have MinGW and GCC. So I'm just going to go ahead and right click on that and I'm going to hit extract all. That's going to open up this dialog right here. And then this is basically asking me where I want to extract those files to. I'm just going to go ahead and extract them to the same directory to my downloads folder for now. So let's hit extract. And as you can see, this is downloading or copying over a lot of files. So this might take a minute to uh, decompress. So I'm just going to fast forward through this. Okay, great. Now that it's done unzipping, I can just close that. Now you can see that in our downloads folder, we have both the zipped up version that I downloaded off of the site and the now decompressed version sitting right here. So the next step we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and open up that decompressed version, the, this folder. And inside of that, you're going to see the MinGW64 folder. Uh, now this is basically the root folder for MinGW. And if you open it up, you're going to see all of the stuff that you need for uh, doing all of the G++ or C++ development. Now, the big thing that we're going to need to do now is we need a way to add this folder to the path so that you can run this from anywhere you want on the command line. Um, so right now, if I were to open up the command line and try to run G++, it's not going to know to come into this folder and open up the bin folder specifically and look at all these binaries. These are where all the executables live, as you can see, for running uh, G++ and, and actually a whole bunch of other utilities that come with MinGW and GCC. So in order to make it so that these are utilities that the operating system knows uh, how to find, we have to add them to the path. So what I'm going to do first is I'm, I'm actually going to go back to this folder right here. I'm still in downloads and you can always just tell that by clicking up here. You can see right now I'm in C users mat downloads and then I'm in that folder that it decompressed into. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take this folder, the MinGW folder, since that's the main one that actually has all of the information I need. I'm going to right click on it and I'm going to hit the little scissor icon here. I'm going to cut it 
You can also have hit Control X to do it, right? And I'm actually going to move this to a different location. So now I'm going to go over here and click on my, this PC, and I'm going to click on the C drive. Now most folks who have Windows-based uh, operating systems, the C drive is sort of like your root drive for the entire operating system. So I'm going to click in here, and this is actually a really good place to go ahead and put that MinGW folder because it's very easy for it to, uh, to get to. It's not uh, buried underneath a whole bunch of other folders. Um, so this is a very typical place you'll see folks put things like that. So I'm going to go ahead and right click right here, and I'm going to hit the little icon for paste. I could also hit Control plus V. All right, and now that just moved it over here to the C drive. So now if I go into that folder, you're going to see this is where everything lives. And if we go into bin, again, this is where all of the uh, binaries that we're going to need to do our development live. And so now this is where the information that I need to have added to the path resides. So again, I'm going to click up here on the little address bar, and I'm going to just take a look at this, and I'm just going to highlight all of it and I'm going to hit control C. I'm going to copy this address, this location on my computer, because I'm going to add that to the path, so I need to have it in my clipboard. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to add this to the path environment variable. And so that's the, sort of the last step in our little journey. So I'm going to go ahead and just open up the, the window key, and then I'm going to start typing environment. Right? And you'll notice that as soon as I start typing environment, one of the very first options that pops up is this one that says edit the system environment variables. That is exactly what I want to do. So I'm going to click on that. And that's going to open up this dialog right here. Uh, this dialog is then going to have another button for me to push called environment variables. So go ahead and click on that. That's going to open up yet another dialog. Um, and this is basically all of the environment variables that you have set on your computer. Um, there are user level environment variables and there are system level environment variables. I'm going to suggest adding this to the system level environment variables. That way, anybody who's running the computer uh, will be able to use the GCC compiler. So you're going to want to pick this one right here called path. Path is a very important environment variable. It is literally the variable that the system uses when it looks for programs to run on your, on your computer. So we're going to just go ahead and double click on that. That's going to open up one more dialog. And these are all of the uh, locations that are like pre-configured on the Windows 11 operating system uh, to be looked in uh, when you're trying to search for a program. And so all I'm going to do is I'm going to add the location that we just put um, into this path. So I'm going to go down here to the very bottom. I'm going to double click right here on this next row. And now I'm going to hit Control V to paste in that location that we just had click away All right and now it's part of the path so now it knows this is one of the places it should look for programs when you're trying to run a program from anywhere on your computer if you want to be really slick about it you can select it and then you can hit move up and the higher up it is in this list is the order that it will search for things so I'm making this now the very first folder that it will go looking for programs that'll make it run a little faster when I'm trying to execute the operations after I'm done I'm gonna click OK OK again and OK a third time. All right, and that's all there is to it. Uh, so now let's go ahead and just test out really quick to make sure that it was installed correctly. To do that, I'm going to go ahead and once again open up this. And I'm going to hit PowerShell. Right? So I'm going to open up the PowerShell uh, terminal. Right? And so now I'm going to try to uh, basically execute the G++ program from the command shell. So to do that, you're just going to type G++. And I'm just going to have it print out the version. So you can do dash dash version, and that'll let you know whether or not it was installed. I do that, and exactly what I was hoping would happen happened. It's telling me that it's using MinGW. It's even telling me the name of the person who compiled the source, which was the Breck Sanders guy. Uh, you can tell that by just coming down to his website and just looking down here, I think a little further, and that's letting you know that's who made this for you. Okay, So it's installed correctly. Everything's working exactly the way I want, and now we have a... G++ compiler available in Windows running natively such that if I were to compile a program um, from PowerShell using this it would make an executable that we could then run on this computer and indeed we could take that executable and just send it over to another Windows based operating system and it will run natively there. There's really no dependencies on anything and that's really the main focus of why I am showcasing this method for getting MinGW and GCC set up is because this is the way that allows you to build Windows native applications using GCC with basically no dependencies. Uh, like I mentioned in the beginning of the video, there are some alternative methods you can use for getting 
a C++ development environment set up for a Windows based operating system. So I'm just going to quickly touch on what those are. I'm not going to walk through every single one of them. I'm just going to show you some alternatives because if you were to Google this, there's a really good chance you're going to see a lot of options, a lot of different ways people set up C++ development on Windows. And there's not a lot of information out there about why you would do one over the other. So I'm going to just kind of quickly fill in those gaps if I can. So the, the most obvious alternative to uh, using G++, if you want to do C++ development, is really asking yourself a question, do you even care about using GCC? So like I said, GCC is one of the most popular and widely used C++ compilers in the world. And so there's a lot of reasons why people like to use that compiler specifically. Um, it usually has to do with being able to have common kind of errors that pop out. If you ever have problems, it's just sort of a, a universal compiler. But you may very well not care at all about using that specific compiler. And if you don't, then I would argue the best alternative to using G++, if you're on a Windows machine, would be to just use the, G, the C++ compiler that's provided by Microsoft. And that would be Visual Studio. So if you come over here to your browser and just click up a new tab, I'm going to type Visual Studio. All right, and I'm just going to hit Enter. And Visual Studio has been around for a very long time. This is the IDE that is developed by Microsoft. Um, it's the their preferred IDE for building pretty much any kind of Windows-based product that you can imagine. And indeed, they have their own C++ compiler that was developed by Microsoft. Um, so you can just come on down here. It looks like it's the second option. I'm going to click on that. It's going to load me into this page. Right. And this is at the time of this video, Visual Studio 2022 is apparently the latest and greatest. They come out with a new one once every couple of years. If you scroll down a little further, I'm sure you'll finally find the one that lets you download. Yeah, download Visual Studio. And they have three different versions that you can download. They have a community edition, which is the free one. They have a professional and an enterprise. These cost money. The community edition gives you pretty much everything you can imagine. Oh, and a pop up as well. Everything you can imagine. I'll click on that at least just to go one step further. Right. And you can download this. Hey, look, it automatically started downloading as soon as I clicked on that. Um, and it'll run you through a whole installation process. And then you'll be using their preferred IDE for doing your C++ development. But keep in mind, if you do this, that you are basically using a completely different compiler. It should conform to the C++ standard, which means that it should have all of the same stuff that the version that GCC uses, but it is written by a different organization, Microsoft in this case. So that's an alternative. Another alternative that you might consider is if you do want to continue to use GCC as the compiler um, and you are still, again, on a Windows based operating system, but you would also like to have a little bit more of the sort of Linux feel as you're doing it. So as you saw when I built this with just straight up MinGW, I'm running everything from PowerShell, which is absolutely a Windows uh, specific uh, shell and it is all Microsoft and a lot of people who do G, uh, C++ development they might have a Windows operating system but they actually want to have an environment very similar to sort of Linux um, and in that case there are a few different alternatives and one of those alternatives that you're going to see a lot of is another platform called uh, MSYS2 or MSYS2 so I'll go ahead and I'll just type that into uh, the search engine. We got MSYS2 popping up here. We come over here and as you can see, it is a completely different organization. Now MSYS2 is very similar to what MinGW gave you in that it, it will actually give you MinGW as a part of this. In fact, you can even see it right here. It's basically what we got. The difference is this is gonna include MinGW and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, that will allow you to basically have a mimicked Linux-like environment uh, for your development process. Uh, the way you can do the installation is you just come to their page, you click on this link, it'll run through an installer. In fact, they even have a little walkthrough of how to do that. And once you're done, you'll have a basically a emulated environment that is similar to how an environment in a Linux distribution would look. So they're even giving you a little preview right here. This is kind of what it'll look like. And notice how that looks very different than PowerShell, right? See how that's a completely different look and feel. Um, they're trying to emulate what it would look like to be on Linux. And this also provides you a few extra features like, well, 
basically a few other utilities that you would find on a Linux based operating system like grep and bash and all that stuff. If that's something that you would like and you would also like to have a package manager built in, which is what this provides, I believe it's called Pacman. Yes, it is. Then this might be an alternative for you. The difference here is if you do your C++ development using this environment, using the msys2 environment, any programs that you produce using this environment will have an inherent dependency on the msys2 DLL. So if you scroll up here, I believe it's up here somewhere, they might actually mention it, uh, or maybe they don't, but the, the alt what's actually happening here is that this is creating a whole environment for you and everything that it's doing is basically being emulated. So you're not actually building Windows native programs if you do stuff in this environment you're producing programs that will run in this little emulation which means that if you ever produce a program and you want to share it with somebody else you would have to make sure that they also had msys2 involved on their machine to have it work properly or you'd have to take the code and recompile it somewhere completely different uh, to make it run there as well. So that's just something uh, to consider and again there's a few other extra bells and whistles that come with this environment uh, which is why some people kind of prefer to do it this way. And it comes with a nice installer which is a, a step up from what we just did with the <laughs> straight up MinGW install. Uh, the next alternative I'm going to talk about is Sigwin. Right, so that's uh, C Y G W I N, right? And Sigwin has been around for a very long time. So you just go here, Sigwin. This is their homepage. So Sigwin is basically a step even above msys2. In fact, msys2 actually uses Sigwin for part of their environment. And uh, basically, what Sigwin is is a um, well, it's it's a much more robust emulation of a Linux environment. So this will emulate more or less an entire Linux-like uh, uh, system on your Windows machine and within that system you can do virtually anything that you would want to do on a Linux machine in their sort of emulated environment. Again to do the installation is simply just to come on down here and click this little setup.exe uh, button. This will download the the installer for you and you run through an installation and then you'll have it. Um, this will emulate, as I said, an entire other ecosystem on your on your Windows machine. Um, and within that ecosystem, you can install packages, you can install GCC, you can install any number of things that you want or need for your development or frankly anything you want to do that's uh, normally something that you would need to do in a Linux environment inside of a Windows environment. Uh, but again, much like my sys2 or msys2, uh, this is going to have a dependency on the SIGWIN DLL. So if you choose to do in, uh, any kind of development within SIGWIN and you develop executables in that environment, you would then have to uh, hand that executable to another person and they would need to have SIGWIN installed on their computer in order for it to run or at the bare minimum have the DLL as a part of that distribution. So you would need to provide them an extra dependency for them to ever run a program of yours. Okay, so that's that's another kind of caveat to this, but this is a far more robust emulation of, of a Linux environment. Um, the last one I'm gonna mention is yet another thing you could do for your Windows-based uh, C++ development is you could use WSL. So WSL, I'll even do WSL2. Um, and we'll scroll over here. What is Windows, <laughs> Windows Subsystem for Linux? And so let's just go ahead and click on that. So uh, WSL is, as this page is saying, is Windows Subsystem for Linux. So starting, I believe, in Windows 10, the Windows operating system had starts to provide the capability to do a full installation of a Linux distribution within the operating system itself, within the Windows operating system. So you can install many different versions of uh, Linux into Windows and they will run simultaneously rather than it being like a dual boot or having your own have to fire up your own virtual machine and kind of run it separately windows is now basically just providing this as a feature of their operating system um, and this is a pretty heavy uh, way to go about it but it is also an extremely popular way and the big advantage to wsl is that it will let you share or interoperate the file system for either operating system. So if you're running, let's say, Ubuntu, which is a kind of Linux distribution, and you're running that within the WSL framework of Windows, that means you can navigate into 
uh, Ubuntu's file system and you can navigate into the Windows operating system file system from either operating systems command line. So you will have a completely different terminal, you'll have a completely different access to completely different uh, operating system basically simultaneously. And this is very, very powerful. It allows people who are on Windows based operating systems the power to sort of jump back and forth between these operating systems um, and do their development uh, on both simultaneously. So it's extremely powerful. Um, it takes quite a bit to set it up. I'm not going to walk through all of that. There's lots of tutorials out there, but this would be a good setup for anybody who wanted or needed, frankly, to have access to both of these architectures, both of these operating system architectures during their development. It's again, very powerful and very useful, but the caveat here is that um, you are basically running two different operating systems. And indeed, much like we discussed for SIGWIN and MSYS2, if you compile program in the WSL system and that produces an executable, that executable will run in that WSL environment which is basically a separate operating system. It won't necessarily run those executables in Windows. So it's basically giving you the power to reach into both operating systems whenever you want, uh, but they are still kind of separate from each other. And so if you want to build Windows native programs, they need to be built in the Windows environment. And MinGW is really the main way that that is accomplished. So hopefully this was helpful to you and hopefully I've demystified some of these several different ways that people tend to come across while they're doing this sort of research. I believe that using the approach that I uh, walked through early on is the most straightforward and uh, simple way to get it set up and it also happens to be the way that requires the least amount of installation or configuration um, or emulation on your system in order to get started. Anyways, I hopefully this was helpful to you and uh, thanks for watching.